Awesome. Thank you so much um, for that introduction and thank you Cincinnati um, for allowing me in the space, People's Liberty um, and Urban Consulate. The title yes. of our talk, yes. Ain't, Ain't I a Woman. woman. Ain't I a woman? We didn't practice that, by the way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't I a woman? Yeah. And so let's talk about the, the genesis of Ain't I a Woman for us. Mm -hmm. As a Michigander, um, Ain't I a Woman, what it means to me and how it initially showed up is a fellow Michigander by the name of Sojourner Truth gave a riveting speech called Ain't I a Woman. And she gave that speech in Ohio, in Akron. Go if we don't come on with this thing okay. right here. Come so, on, let's do it, come on. We gotta ground it and situate this talk and talk yes, about we do. the. Yes, okay. Um, we're gonna be doing this all day, so y'all can <laughs> hold tight, get we ready. We only got 30 minutes. I know, I know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and so, what Sojourner Truth did was she actually took her feminist contemporaries to task mm -hmm. for only focusing on the lived experiences of white women. And she didn't stop there. She also took the task um, abolitionists who were also solely focusing on the rights of black men. Mm -hmm. And then as we follow up or fast forward her riveting Ain't I a Woman speech, the way it shows up now in this contemporary movement building is in 1981, Bell Hooks yes. named her book, Ain't I a Woman? And then of course, um, black legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw mm -hmm. also coined intersectionality inspired by Ain't I a Woman? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for us to first ground our talk to be very specific that we are talking about the intersectionality of being black and being woman. Yes. And so, Kiana, what I want to do is, I wanna lift up your work, and I want you to talk about some of the challenges that you were seeing in the work that you were doing on the ground every day that are unique and specific to black women. Absolutely, and I'm glad you brought up Bell Hooks because I have a quote from her here uh, where she says, usually when people talk about the strength of black women, they ignore the reality that to be strong in the face of oppression is not the same as overcoming oppression. That endurance is not to be confused with transformation. Mm. So as we talk about the Ain't I a Woman and how it got started around uh, feminism and uh, the abolitionists only focusing on black women, I'm sorry, black men, mm -hmm. when we talk about Ain't I a Woman now, we talk about the myth of the strong black woman and how that is detrimental to who we are as black women, as human beings, right, that right. feel and that have pain and emotion and all those things. And oftentimes we're looked at as super women. That's right. And my, my shirt says black girl magic, but just because we're black, we're magic doesn't mean we aren't real. That's right. So I want to start with that. And, and so let me add to that while you begin to talk about some of the data and statistics. You know, one of the questions that I ask too is what is this fascination with black women's strength Yes. But when it comes to our trauma and our pain, there are very little resources for it. Absolutely. So you're fantasizing about our strength, but mm -hmm. when it comes to our support, there are little resources. Talk about some of the trauma and experiences and challenges that black women are facing right now today. Absolutely. So Naima mentioned that I work for an organization called the Health Collaborative, uh, where I serve as Executive Director of Population Health Strategies here in Greater Cincinnati. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is, is as she mentioned, create uh, a more equitable Cincinnati when it comes to health. So we know that uh, here in greater Cincinnati, we have very, very poor outcomes, despite the fact that we have some of the greatest healthcare resources in the nation. We have six health systems here in a 10 mile radius, um, but at the same time, we are at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to outcomes around diabetes and obesity and, and heart disease and all of these things. And so when you start to look at black women, it's even worse. Yeah. So breast cancer, as an example, um, despite the fact that black women have lower rates of diagnosis um, of breast cancer, the mortality rates are extremely high when it comes to white women. When we talk about obesity, black women are 60% more likely to be obese uh, than black women are. And the list just kind of goes on and on and on. Um, and so what we see around health disparities and what is really um, leading to these health disparities is racism in healthcare. That's right. And that's one of the things that we don't want to talk about. Um, we talk about implicit bias, right? Really nice way of saying, oh, well, everybody has bias. It's not that big of a deal. No, it is that big of a deal. 
it is that big of a deal um, because at the same time that there's implicit bias, there's also explicit bias. That's right. There is racism in healthcare. When you think about things that happened back in 1910, the Flexner Report as an example, where the American Medical Association um, commissioned the Carnegie Foundation to do a study on American uh, medical schools, okay. basically trying to create the medical profession as an elitist thing, mm -hmm. right? But they, they went and got this guy named Abraham Flexner, who was not a medical doctor in any way, never been trained. He had a degree um, in liberal arts, no shade, I'm just saying, um, and ran a non-for-profit uh, school in Louisville, Kentucky. That's right. So why is he the expert that you're gonna commission That's to right. do a study on medical schools? So anyway, long story short, what that did was force a lot of medical schools to close across the nation, um, including black medical schools. There were a total of seven. After this report came out, there were two, Howard and Meharry. That's mm. it. And so when you think about the fact that there aren't a lot of black physicians, now those numbers are increasing, right. but there are not a lot of black physicians out there. Um, think about the fact that the, these black medical schools close leaving the white ones, and then they didn't accept black people. That's right. So what did they think that was going to happen? That's right. So That's those right. are just some of the things that um, are contributing to health disparities. There are other things, mm -hmm. but th these are the things that nobody wants to talk about. That's right. And it's impacting black women more so than anything else. Yeah. There was a CBS News study done last year mm -hmm. where a professor from Harvard Medical School said, we don't believe black women when they say they're in, in pain. pain. Now, for him to say that out loud on national TV, and of course, black Twitter went crazy, and all these black women came out and were telling stories about some of the things that they experienced going to the doctor, where their doctors would not give them medication right. because they assumed that they were not in pain or that they had a higher tolerance of pain or that they were just seeking drugs. Right. But then when you turn around and look at the heroin opioid epidemic, who, who, are, who are the people that are actually abusing the, the drugs, That's the right. prescription drugs? It wasn't us, because we couldn't even get it. That's right. So I'll just stop there, because I can go all day long talking about this. Yeah, so I want to thank you for that. I, I want to lift up um, some, some data and some statistics to support um, what you were saying. And so as it relates to health-related or what we call chronic-related diseases, what I, what I call lifestyle diseases, mm -hmm. and this is it's heartbreaking for me. Mm -hmm but 50,000 African-American women die every year from heart disease. Yes. And how that translates is 137 women, black women die daily mm -hmm. from heart disease. It troubles me as well when I hear that 92% of black women are overweight mm -hmm. and 59% are obese. And they're anticipating that in the next five years, 90% mm -hmm. of black women will be overweight. And it's not only the health crises in terms of statistics and numbers and how this kind of shows up is that we have to make sure that what we're reading in the news and, and about black women, we aren't being gaslit. Absolutely. In these, in these, in these stories and this data isn't being put out there and we don't peel back the onion layers. So a lot of um, reports and articles are being written about the fact that from 2007 to 2018, the number of black-owned businesses owned by black women grew 165%. Mm -hmm. That's great. But? However, <laughs> exactly, you have to but. peel back the onion layers. But what they don't tell you is that when these black women start businesses, their annual revenue hovers about 28,000, mm -hmm. and that's compared to white women at 175, 180,000. And so we have to be very clear when we start talking about some of the challenges that are facing um, black women. Mm -hmm. Another statistic that you will hear um, as well is that black women are probably the most educated demographic on the planet Say Earth. Say that. We have more associate degrees, more college degrees, more master's degrees, more PhDs than any other ethnic group on the planet. That's right. But what they don't tell you is that black women also are in debt. There was an article that was in the Detroit Free Press in my hometown paper, and it said that black women 
end up with almost $25,000 more in college debt mm -hmm. than your average white male. And how that works out is that we are 56% more in debt mm -hmm. because of us getting loans for college than the average white male is. And then we come out and get jobs and they don't want to pay us equal pay. Exactly. And so all of these are challenges mm -hmm. that black women face. And so where I really want to take us is I don't want to leave us there. Right. Because we didn't come here on this stage here at Cincinnati at People's Liberty brought to you by Urban Consulate to talk about the problems. Hey. We just wanted to set them up for the solutions. Exactly. We wanted to, 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 to take them on a trip to show them that those individuals who are most impacted by the problem are those individuals who are going to also provide us the solutions, solutions to the problems as well. And so I don't believe for one second, and there's another, I wrote this down too, Kiana, mm -hmm. because this right here kills me all, all the time. There's another um, headline news as well that we read about all the time in the paper, and I just mm -hmm. want to clear up something. Black women are not here to save America from no, America. Black women, let's be clear, when we vote, we don't vote to save this country, we vote to save ourselves. ourselves. It just right. so happens that when black women save ourselves, everyone happens to benefit from that. Exactly. Let's be you clear say about that. Again. that. Say it again. Because what we know from our mothers and our, and our grandmothers and mm -hmm. our big mamas and our aunties and our sisters is that no one, absolutely no one, ain't coming to save us or protect us so but another ain't. black woman. Exactly. All right. So let's, let's be clear on that, right? And so, Kiana, let's talk about now the workarounds that black women are created because we know systems that inherently don't support or care for our community, we have to create those solutions. Tell me what you're seeing on the ground in terms of solutions or initiatives that are being headed by black women and being supported in the community. Absolutely. So the one thing that I do have to say is we are seeing more and more black women get into politics as well. I'm Absolutely. an example of that. Um, so when we get into those places where we can make policy change that's going to be lasting for generation after generation, that's right. just one way. So yeah. I do want to mention that. But I want to be clear, too. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between, because I know you're going to take us there, there is a difference between what I call community care Right. And, and workarounds yes. in the community and what you're talking about, which is structural institutional change. Absolutely. Right? So we're on both levels. We're on the ground in the community mm -hmm. and we're also in larger institutions making structural and systemic changes. Absolutely. So I know you're going to take us there. Yes. Let's go community first. And we need both. We, oh, absolutely. Um, so one thing that one that comes to mind when we talk about different data and statistics around black women's health. Um, I'm thinking about infant mortality, right? Ooh. We have a, a, a crazy infant mortality issue here in um, Hamilton County. In particular, black babies are dying. So we have an organization here called Cradle Cincinnati who their, their whole uh, function is to eliminate um, infant mortality. Mm. Um, organization is about five years old. I would say in the past couple of years, um, I've been really impressed with their executive director, uh, Ryan Adcock, who happens to be a white man. Um, and what he has said was, we need to be specific. Mm -hmm. Just like when we say, we don't say people of color when we're talking about black people. That's we don't right. say women of color when we're talking about, about black, black women. women. We're going to be right. specific. And he has been specific to say, okay, the data is actually saying it's black babies. So we need to call that out. In addition to that, what he has done is a really great job of hiring black women to lead the work. That's right. Who better to address black women's reproductive issues, pregnancy issues, infant mortality than the women who are actually experiencing that. Okay. So I do have to applaud him for that um, and being really intentional about that. There is an initiative within Cradle Cincinnati called Queens Village. Mm. And uh, the, the young woman who is leading up that work, Dr. Meredith Shockley Smith, um, also a very admire her very much. You're shaking your head because you already know, um, has created a space specifically for black women. That's it. It's for us. Mm -hmm. No, you can't come. 
And that's not racist, that's not trying to be, you know, exclusionary, but we need a space for us where we can talk, where we can be real, yes. where we can be honest, and we can be supportive yes. to one another. And so when you talk about that community care, just having that space where you can be honest and be around people that look like you and, ex and have the same experiences as you, yeah. it, it impacts the entire community in yeah. ways that you can't even imagine. And I, and I want to take this from this community care level, and, and, and let's talk about this in terms of how and where I'm seeing this scale, particularly mm -hmm. as it relates to this infant mortality rate mm -hmm. and maternal mortality as well, because black Absolutely. women are also dying on the hospital table yes. giving birth or being left with like scars and mm -hmm. things of that nature because they are quick to do a C-section if they see any trauma or any trouble. Mm -hmm. And so where I'm seeing this really show up is that um, there's an organization in Detroit um, that comes composed of black women too that are really working with woman, women around breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And um, I am a food advocate, a food, ac uh, a food activist, but one of the things that's so important to me is what we call first food. And yes. first food is the baby's f first food. And in many cases, mm -hmm. it's the breast milk, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I think um, the way I'm seeing it show up is that black women more and more as we talk about community care are really turning to doulas yes. and turning to midwifery mm -hmm. and midwives mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and providing support for one another there. And the reason why I love this organization, the, that black women supporting other black women when it comes to breastfeeding, and here's a bit of intersectionality, is that it has been documented that already around 40% of black women, um, when they first give birth, start to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And the report basically says that number dramatically decreases when black women don't have the support around yes. them to help them to continue breastfeeding or to support them while they're breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And that support really shows up for black women as their partners. Right. Their partners are the ones that helps them, that supports them while they're going through breastfeeding. And the reason why the numbers dramatically decrease for black women over white women is due to mass incarceration. Yes. So when black men are taken out of the home and being locked up in cages, it affects black women who are breastfeeding their children because now their partner, their husband, their lover has now been incarcerated and that interrupts now her ability to breastfeed her baby. And yes. so now this intersectionality shows up even when it comes to us being able to be mothers to our children, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love the fact, too, that you lifted up, you know, the, the village that you mm -hmm. talked about. Queens well, in, in Detroit, we have another woman. Her name is Sonia Brown, and I want to lift Auntie Nay up because Auntie Nay is a black woman, too, had basically turned her home mm -hmm. in her block into her community into a health clinic a food pantry, clothing mm -hmm. distribution center, and a tutorial center. And so, you know, we know what our problems are. Absolutely. We just need to be supported as it relates to the solutions. And so there, there is another solution um, that I want to talk about and make sure I lift up um, as we talk about this obesity crisis mm. around black women. And there is an organization that is being led by Vanessa and Morgan, and the name of that organization is called Girl Trek. Yes. And Girl Trek has a goal that by the year 2020, they want to get a million black women walking. And Girl mm -hmm. Trek, for me, their TED Talk is amazing, but Girl Trek, to me, is not more than just a, a, uh, a commitment and a sisterhood of daily walking. It really is a movement. Right. And so I love seeing some of this work that's being started on the ground. Let's talk about, does data at all influence your work? Are you looking at reports? Are you looking at some of the data that's being published? And how does that data impact your work? And how is it so important that I know some of our philanthropic partners or some mm -hmm. of our civic leaders can fund some research to help us guide our work even more clearly and intentionally? 
Absolutely. So my work is all about data-driven solutions. Yeah. So um, in addition to the work that I get to lead for the Health Collaborative, we also serve as a health information exchange for the region. So we have clinical and claims data um, that we get from our member hospitals and health systems and from the plans that we can use to make decisions about what our uh, in interventions need to be. Yeah. Absolutely. That's how we know uh, where the disparities lie. Um, not only that, we also have access to human resource data yeah. um, from our members. So we know uh, what the demographics of the workforce is in, in the health systems as well. Um, we try to help them with their diversity, um, both internally and externally. We have a couple of pipeline programs where we're trying to target minority students who are interested in becoming uh, healthcare professionals in their junior year, whether they want to become a physician or if they want to uh, be in more of the allied health careers. But everything that we do is derived through the data that we use. Yeah. Um, what I will say, and I think somebody else mentioned this earlier about data, um, there's, there was a saying, I think it was Jay-Z that said, men lie, women lie, data doesn't, or numbers don't. Numbers can lie because people can manipulate Manipulate data as well Absolutely. to make it say what they want it to say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we rely on, or ex in Detroit, we rely on data a lot. And I know I rely on the data when I'm doing my work at Food Lab to incubate and support and accelerate um, women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But Chase was on the stage um, earlier, talked about the city of Detroit, and this is why mm -hmm. it's so important to let women lead. And Chase talked about Detroit being 140 square miles, and what that looks like is you mm -hmm. can put the island of Manhattan, the city of Boston, and the city of San Francisco inside of Detroit proper and still mm -hmm. have room left over. And then he talked about the fact that the, a third or to a quarter to the city is vacant. Mm -hmm. And so we had that data. And with that data, we also understand that in 2007, every major and national grocery store also left the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking about this word that did not come out of community, in which this word um, we discard in community and we, are, um, we don't use it at all is the word food desert. We don't mm -hmm. use the word food desert in Detroit because we, we would rather use food apartheid because our, what was done to our communities was intentional. And we don't use the word food desert as well because we know that things grow in the city of Detroit. Not only people, but also fruits and vegetables. Right. And so knowing that data, um, there was a group of elders uh, that we call the gardening angels mm -hmm. who came together to start what we now know as the Detroit, um, 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 Oh my God, Ashley's going to kill me. The name <laughs> of the nonprofit organization is Keep Growing Detroit, um, but Detroit, Keep Growing Detroit has something that's called the Garden Resource Program. Mm -hmm. And it really came out of our elders, black women, who kind of started this, what we call urban agricultural movement. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, and the elders knowing that we had the land, we had the resources, we had the water to grow, Keep Growing Detroit leveraged that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I can report today as I look at Keep Growing Detroit's annual report that in the city of Detroit last year they passed out 98,000 packet of seeds, 265 transplants, and the city of Detroit grew 467,000 pounds of food. That's amazing. Ain't no food desert, okay? And that's because older black women said, we can grow food in the city of Detroit. Yeah. And now how that kind of shows up. And I think another thing that, you know, I'm really, um, really, really excited about as it relates to data is that black women are starting to do the research um, as well. Project Diane is an amazing research that talked about the lack of funding from black founders. Mm -hmm. Catherine Kenny kind of commissioned that research and started Digital Undivided to bridge the gap between black women founders and how they're funded. And then the work that Food Lab does really leverages the work from the um, Aetna Foundation, the Robert Woods Foundation that talked mm -hmm. about how do we build and cultivate healthy communities from the aspect mm -hmm. of, it's not only important to have fresh food in these communities, but you also need to make sure that people who live in these communities have living wage jobs. Absolutely. And you also have to make sure that not only that, but the built environment. And I can say that through the work of, of one of our partners and my program officers in the room, New Economy Initiative, Food Lab has not only had the opportunity to help to incubate and start healthy food businesses, many of them being led by black women, but we also are talking about what does that food business look like when it's providing Detroiters 
who in many cases are returning citizens, mm -hmm. who in many cases are young people, who in many cases are um, veterans, mm -hmm. um, or people, elderly people who are made looking for second jobs. What does it look like to provide not only good food, but also good living wages in the right. restaurant industry, right? And it's amazing that these women have been leading the charge in Detroit to transform the restaurant industry. One of our Food Lab member businesses came out last year and said, we're no longer accepting tips. We're going to pay our staff an equitable right. and living wage. Well, we don't need to take need tips, tips from our customers mm -hmm. to subsidize our, uh, our workers. Lo and behold, this year, uh, Brad Greenfield, who's a white male chef, when he announced his new business or his new food business, Magnet, he then said, I'm not going to do tipping either. I hey, said, well, come on then, Brad. Go, with it. It. Come, come on, on, Brad. Come on, come Brad. On, Brad. <laughs> come on with us, right? And then I just got an alert from <clears throat> um, the Cranes, Detroit, that another restaurateur, his name is Sandy Levine, Sandy owns Chartreuse, he said that, you know what, I'm now going to start providing all of my full-time workers health care through Plum Care. Well, I said, go. well, come on, Sandy, come on, come on Let's in. Let's do it. And welcome, Sandy. Oh, so it's just kind of like, <laughs> we're leading this charge about changing industry. Absolutely. And that's what I'm talking about, systemic and structural changes. Yes. How do we tear down an entire industry and build it back up. And you know why we have to do it? Because we the ones that's working in the industry. Right, So, exactly. I mean, you know, I know my sister Jessica talked about black folks' love of chicken. And uh, <laughs> I know she talked about it. You didn't tell me too much, Jessica. I know you talked about that chicken. And listen, we have to really think about this chicken um, in terms of the fact, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, because that chicken is just pain in the middle of two buns, if you ask me. But yeah. I'm not going to mention the company that we're standing in line for to get this chicken sandwich. But when I think about this sandwich, I think about the black women who are the fast food workers, who are Absolutely. behind the register ringing mm -hmm. up the sales, and the black men and women who are behind uh, the fry or frying mm -hmm. the chicken, or even our Latino brothers and sisters too who are down in the processing plant in Mississippi processing the chicken. So it's a lot that we have to think about, but black women are thinking intentional like this. Let's wrap this up and let's talk about vision. What, what do you see? <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. We're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna wrap this up and, 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 let me, and let's talk about, I think Claire been holding that five minute sign for 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so let's talk about vision. Where do we want to go? Where do we see? I mean, we talk about black women are not um, uh, superhuman. Mm -hmm. You know, we aren't here to save America from America, but I believe America should follow Absolutely. black women. Uh, we, yeah, they have yeah. to. Okay. Yeah. And so where do you see the future? You talked about, I want you to talk a little bit about black women um, that is now becoming our elected leaders. Yes. And congratulations again, sis, thank you. Thank on your you. city thank council um, you. Um, you. position. Maybe mayor one day. I, I think yeah. now we've all got... All the way to the White House. All the way to... My, hey, listen, yeah. claim it. We've got, we've got several black women mayors now. Um, so let's talk about some of the vision that you want to see. David, I just want to hear you talk all day long. <laughs> I don't even want to. <coughs> no, I could no, just no. be your amen sister. In no, the no, 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 no. I want to talk. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guest um, in Cincinnati, so I just, I want to hear. No, you belong and, here. No, let, no, you can. Let me tell you something, girl. You ain't gonna get me out of Detroit. <laughs> Wrap they it up, they probably want me out of Detroit, but you they not going to, mm, mm that's, that's too easy. I'm, I'm going to stay Detroit, in Detroit. Oh, no, you have to come to Detroit. I am. You, December 2nd, I'll be there. Okay. So. Well, yeah. The yeah, longest yeah. project runway come with. Okay. okay. All right, anyway. Well, just, you I'll, I, what I'll sum up and say is, I'm, you, you touched on this earlier. I'm of the belief if we lift up black women, yeah. everybody will be lifted up. Yeah. That's what we have to do. There, there's an uh, initiative here. Uh, Dora was here from Greater Cincinnati Foundation earlier and talked about a lot of the work that they're doing around equity um, and philanthropy and other things. But they commissioned a study last year um, through their initiative called All In Cincinnati, which is all about equity. And that is what the report said. Yeah. If we lift up black women, if we get black women in positions of power, if we pay them a living wage, if we give them access to the things that they need, childcare, transportation, yeah. all of those things, the entire city will benefit. Yeah. I need people to understand that. I need people to get behind that. And I need people to fund that. That's right. And we will be all right. We will be. 
And I guess I'll end just by saying that I envision a world, I know we've been talking about 2045, mm -hmm. but I do envision a world where black women, we own our work. Yes. And we become empowered to control our own economic destiny. Yes. So absolutely. thank y'all so much thank for this you. talk.